Thank you. Thank you for this introduction. Just uh, put some timer here. All right. Before I start, we need to do very important stuff. I need to take a selfie. <laughs> so I'll try to make it with myself and whole audience. So it's very important. So we'll try, I'll try to do like this and try to fit in and selfie. That's cool. Okay, so we were done with this guy. And now we can talk business, right? If you're gonna like uh, do tweeting, feel free. Hashtag jcash, hashtag hazelcast. Um, and uh, today we're gonna talk about the caching. What is caching, why it's important, why you need to, uh, why you need this in, in general. And basically, I'll try to put like five first slides because I know like there's lots of food there so I don't wanna lose you guys when you go into like this, like a sugar, what else, stuff, coma that we have here or drunk because there's lots of beer. So I will put like very important information in five slides and after that we're gonna do, um, do coding and uh, code and stuff. So the cash, cash usually used to do, um, to store result of some very expensive task. It can be a database call, very slow database call. It can be a result of some computation. And if the result is there in cache, you will usually have a cache hit. If nothing is there, we usually have a cache miss. And if you think about the caching, you will see the caching is everywhere, right? So for example, what is this? Who can tell me what is this? What? No, it's, it's in memory, no SQL, key value, storage, aka hash map. <laughs> no, you see, if you think here, it's in memory because it's around inside the JVM heap, right? Key value storage, you store a key in value, and it's no SQL, it doesn't use any, uh, any SQL here, right? So, but who can tell me what's the problem with this uh, piece of code? I'll give you a hint. Uh, that's a problem uh, if you try to access this stuff in multiple threads. Anyone? Uh, not really. So we, if we try to, you know, doesn't really matter if like this snippet of code like very slow. Uh, think about this maybe somewhere between another thread run, right? So in this case, this is this hash map is not uh, thread safe, right? How we can fix this? Well, let's assume it's not local, right? What do you usually do if you need to uh, provide the trace safety? Correct. Why synchronize is bad? Why to do synchronize is bad? Why, um, why co uh, collection dot synchronized map is bad than this thing? Why this thing is better? What collection dot synchronized map returns? Well, no. The, the problem is with what collection dot uh, dot uh, get synchronized map returns. What it does? It it it, it returns. I don't really remember. So for this case, we can use. Uh, um, Give me a second, I'll tell you exactly. So the thing is that um, this method returns hash table. And hash table is, is, is much worse because there's lots of internal logs. Concurrent hash map works much better. However, uh, there's a problem with concurrent hash map. We cannot uh, share this between multiple processes. And for this purpose, we can use Hazelcast map. So from a perspective of API that you usually use, um, this map, you're not changing much code. You're still using the same API, you're using map API, right? Stays the same. However, we can share this map across multiple processes. But in this case, we depend on some product called Hazelcast, but we don't want to, right? We want to stay, uh, um, how would say, we want to stay standard as possible. So in this case, enter Jcash. So Jcash is the vendor agnostic API for accessing um, map-like structure in in the same in the same f flavor that, uh, for example, concurrent 
map provides. So you basically have same semantics. However, it looks more like a caching application and it doesn't depend on any vendor uh, implementation. Yes. So finally, we can talk, I can introduce myself. Now you know what I'm going to talk about. I'm Victor. Um, I work at the Hazelcast as a solution architect. I speak to developers in the conferences, uh, user groups, and uh, other events. And I also co-author of uh, Enterprise Web Development book. Uh, this book about JavaScript, not Java. So we will skip it. So DevNexus. We already, uh, you already heard about DevNexus. I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there with three talks. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the Spring Framework. There's going to be an awesome battle between very experienced uh, speakers and very experienced Java guys, uh, Jakob Fein and Barak Sadogursky. We're going to do like, uh, we're going to fight e each other on the stage for your uh, entertainment. <laughs> but we're going to use like a Spring configuration as our, um, as our like lightsabers. And a couple more other talks I'm going to do there. And it's much better if you do yourself um, present for, for, for Christmas to buy tickets today than Apple Watch, because it's cheaper. <laughs> and you will take much more uh, useful stuff from, from the conference. OK. And you may still get the watch from it. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, yes. Um, OK, so let's talk Jcash. All right. So first of all, I really like this, uh, this comic. And actually, this comic, very suitable in this particular, in particular situation, that um, the, the standard that was finally finalized in March of 2014 um, is actually was in like a 10 years in the works. So it's actually like solved one of the problems. Like, let's. Uh, uh, we have multiple implementation of different caches. We have in-process caches like uh, each cache or Guava or um, Apache. Some collection probably have something. Um, or we have some distributed uh, uh, systems like uh, Coherence, uh, Hazelcast, and m many others. So let's put uh, some of the um, standard API. And uh, so what was the problem with map, you, you might ask? By the way, let me ask you. So, how many of you ever worked with Jcash before this uh, before this day? Okay, how many of you read Jcash specification before this day? That's cool. How many of you implemented Jcash specification at least some part? Whew. Because sometimes it may be some guy, you know, when you're doing this talk on Jawan, for example, there's definitely one person in the room who can say, yes, I implemented, you wrong. All right. So, what was the problem with the uh, with the map? Right. I will show you the map. Map is good enough. Uh, we can do like something uh, in memory uh, caching. Using how many of you write the cache using map in your life, guys? You and the friend. We're friends here. Don't, <laughs> don't be shy. It's fine. It's okay if you write like the uh, even with hash map. It's also fine. So, but here's the problems. That. Um, that's uh, Jcash trying to solve, like the API trying to solve. So in map, you have key value storage. In cache, you also have key value storage. Um, uh, because you're running it um, in, con like, for example, concurrent hash map allows <laughs> concurrent access, allows, uh, provides you con uh, concurrent access with uh, some at atomic updates. Jcash also can do that. However, there's multiple problems. If you ever implemented your cache with hash map, how many of you run it out of memory exception? With, yeah, at least you have some <laughs> honest people. I know, guys, everyone was there. So you cannot expire some entries. You cannot evict them. So this is kind of problems uh, trying to jcache solve. Um, because um, the cache, is essentially, it's a temporal uh, or temporary uh, storage for, for a data. It's not meant to be stored like for, for years. It's not persisted storage. It's not database, etc. So entries can be evicted. A a a entries can be, you know, can disappear. And it would be nice if they can disappear automatically based on some rules. For example, uh, to prevent out of memory exception, you can uh, evict based on heap percentage, for example. 
<coughs> you uh, in uh, Java Util map, you always storing uh, uh, by reference. Actually, Jcache doesn't uh, doesn't say much about this. How these values can be stored by reference or by value, it doesn't matter. Um, but there is API how we can check if you can um, if you can store by reference, meaning that you're not storing actual value, you're storing the reference of the object. Um, and uh, you can store it by, by value when you actually store some, I don't know, like binary payload or serialized form of stuff. Um, it's not possible to, uh, to listen to some events on map. There are some frameworks that can do that, but there is no like way all the, all the standard map uh, provide you this. Uh, there's no listeners, uh, there's no um, integration with uh, underlying storage. Uh, for example, sometimes you wanna delegate the call to, 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 um, to fill the cache with data, but you don't wanna do it like manually, do cache.put, cache.put. You wanna do it automatically. If something not in the cache, you wanna say, hey, cache, go to my database and load it from database. So Jcache gives you that. And some nice stuff like statistics and uh, um, uh, JMX, uh, type of things that will be exposed. All right, interesting stuff. Jcache doesn't dictate topology. It doesn't dictate how and where stuff gonna be stored. So potentially implementation of the Jcache can be stored not inside J JVM at all. You can store it off here. Um, so let's uh, couple couple historical facts. Um, it's a standard API. Uh, that uh, starting, uh, what, what, you know, if you see this number of this GSR, you understand. This is one of the, f one at least like in the first-ish uh, GSR that was um, created and that was like over 10 years in development. And there is uh, actually already today tons of implementation that support Jcache. And uh, obviously because of the, uh, Final uh, JKR specification uh, authors were from Oracle and uh, Hazelcast. Coherence and Hazelcast is there. Um, Hcache, Infinispan from Red Hat, Apache Ignite, uh, they support Jcache and they actually, um, you know, pass the TCK. Uh, you can follow, there's, I will post the slides after and you can actually get, go to this link and see uh, compatible implementations. Uh, Couchbase, I have this start there because they're claiming that they are, their driver um, is Jcache compatible, but they didn't pass TCK yet. Okay, so let's talk about Jcache Foundation. So what is the building blocks of, of uh, Jcache API? So, yes. Yes. Awesome question. So um, as I said here, it works with JDK 6, 7, and 8, meaning that it doesn't depend on any uh, uh, Java EE stuff. It's just a one jar that you put in your, I will show you with the code later, but it doesn't depend on any technology. And uh, you know about the f uh, integration with uh, some external framework, including Java EE, I'm gonna talk in the end. There's a couple slides that explains vision of this technology in future. <clears throat> okay, so there's like four building like blocks of Jcache. So everything starts with the class called caching. And the caching provides the way how um, the uh, object called caching provider will be retrieved. So um, using the Java SPI concepts, um, J, uh, Jcache implementation will put um, uh, in the service, uh, web NF, uh, uh, meta NF services, uh, there would be a file called um, caching provider that will point to actual implementation and the caching um, uh, class that allows to load actual classes that will, um, will be used in the future to access cache manager. So cache manager will be used to retrieve actual caches. So if you think of this from, from perspective of um, database, for example, or JDBC, right? Um, you can think about the cache as a table. Uh, the cache manager instance of, of your table, or the caching provider and caching, this is your JDBC driver, basically. And from your application, uh, 
you're just uh, you know, interacting with the cache uh, that you can uh, retrieve from cache manager that can be instantiated by caching provider. And we're gonna see some code right now. So, um, okay, let's see what we have here. Um, you already saw this code today. Um, this kind of code um, was on my, my slide. So this is a um, caching class where we're starting everything from, from, from it. And uh, we're getting access to a uh, cache, cache provider. And uh, by default, if there is, um, as I said, there is a jar. For example, uh, in this case, I'll show you. If there is a jar that has inside the services this guy with pointer to actual implementation. So this caching dot get caching provider will load this guy and will make them available to, to work. And after that, uh, from the caching provider, you can access the cache manager. So from the cache manager, basically you can get the cache if ca this cache was uh, previously created or um, using the um, uh, jcache API, the, I have uh, another example. I can either create cache before that, I need to provide configuration for the cache. Or if there is a pre-configured cache available, you can just retrieve it. And you can do some sort of interesting thing. Um, let me actually run this application and I will show you uh, one more interesting thing. So, yes? Would you mind to show a screen share? What? Would you mind to please share a screen share? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Ah, it's IntelliJ. How it's related? <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, IntelliJ. So, um, so what I see here, what you see here right now, I have my Hazelcast instance running, and uh, there is like very nice tool that we have that allows to see contents of the cache. So what I did here, uh, I just uh, start in the cache provider. I get the access to the cache, and I put three values inside the cache, so I can see here. Um, inside the statistics, it was like a throughput. Like, it makes sense, right? So because I, I did it from, from the code. If I, uh, if I start another instance of this guy, um, first of all, they will, they will, they will uh, form the cluster, I believe, and statistics are gonna change. Okay. Yeah, so I have a six puts here. Why here four, why here is two? I'm gonna explain this a little bit at the end. But um, in this case, what's important to, to remember in this particular piece of code is that two jars that important you to have in your class path to run this application. First one is jcache API, which is uh, this guy. And another one is implementation of jcache. So you can put coherence, uh, just you know, throw away Hazelcast, bring coherence, throw away coherence, bring Hazelcast, your application code will not gonna change. This is whole purpose of, um, of this uh, specification itself. Sorry, yes. Do you have currently uh, a web app running? Yes. This has nothing to do with, it's just a, a utility that allows me to show you contents of the running application. Instead of like a debugging and show you putting breakpoints and stuff like that. Okay? Okay, so talk about listeners. So this is actually a very famous um, uh, picture that you can find in some Soviet um, military institutions, I would say. You might be familiar about KGB and stuff. So this is kind of uh, things that, um, so the basically it says you need to keep your military secrets and uh, the governmental secrets in safe because there is a listener. So we're gonna talk about listeners. So in, uh, in, uh, 
In Jcash, there is a concept of a listener that allows you to listen different types of events that happen inside the cache. So uh, it follows um, uh, observer pattern. It has, you need to implement your listener for uh, different types of events. Um, who can tell me why it's better to implement interface for each and every type of event instead of having one big interface for all kind of events and just, you know, leave implementation empty? It, it, it's, it's true about lifecycle events, but it's not nothing to do with this. So the thing is, uh, when you have a listener for a particular type of event, your event will be triggered only in this kind of situation. Um, so if you have a listener for all types of events, even though you're not listening for these events, this event will be triggered, which is sometimes maybe expensive uh, operation. Um, actually, until version, until version Hazelcast 3.3, we actually have like one big interface, and <laughs> this is why um, we look into the uh, Jcash implementation, and now since 3.4, we have everything's cool. Um, yeah, so uh, we need to uh, create the configuration uh, to pass uh, different types of, um, to pass our listeners, and um, we also can have uh, the filters that allows us not only uh, get invoked by a particular event that happened in the cache, but also like a filter if we do really need uh, this kind of events, right? And uh, you will see a lot of this guy today. So in terms of listeners, um, uh, so what I have here, uh, let me actually shut down these guy, two guys so I can continue. Okay, so how, how does it look like from perspective of, of the um, from over the code? Let's start with the uh, listener itself. Um, so in this case, uh, my particular listener implements two interfaces. One interface is cache entry created and uh, cache entry updated. So in this case, uh, from interface cache entry uh, created, if you can see, there's one method on create, uh, and uh, the framework that you know, implements the Jcache will pass the actual value um, um, inside inside this event variable. So you can get uh, access to previous value if you need it. You can access to new value that was set, and etc. So and the same same thing with the uh, cache uh, entry updated interface. Um, just need to implement method on updated. It's easy enough, right? So it's nothing. I'm not. Open your eyes, you already uh, did this, I believe, multiple times. Um, so a uh, nice thing about um, this kind of approach is that we also have ability to have filters on top of these events. So even though um, we are listening for all created, all update events, we can also uh, trigger our method only if particular entry was created. So in this case, I'm also can apply filter. In this case, I'm implementing cache entry event filter interface. And in this case, um, I populated cache with some capitals, and I want my uh, my listener will be triggered only if one of the capitals is London. So if I run this, um, before I run, I will show you configuration. So again, this is uh, also standard part and. Um, as you can see, uh, there is no like proprietary APIs. This is not proprietary API because it's the my 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 code, my user code, and this is uh, API Jcash API JavaX.cache um, uh, packages. So um, to in to enable listener uh, for the cache, uh, what I need to do here, um, I need to create a configuration for for cache listener. So in this case, it's called, uh, I need to um, create instance of uh, cache entry listener configuration. And I need to pass the, um, this is actually like a weird part of the Jcache API. So first of all, you can implement uh, your listener, uh, your listener factory that will, uh, uh, will be responsible for creating the instances of your listener. Um, 
and they come up with this um, um, sorry, uh, sort of um, mm, helper, a helper class that will generate factory for you. So you can just you know, implement the listener and after that the factory would be created for you. It's sort of like um, you know, typical Java application. We're trying to solve the problem introduced with one pattern but introducing another pattern. Right, so in this case, we're solving problem that we need to solve with factory by introducing factory builder. It's kind of like very Java, so um, this is why people love Java. Um, okay, so in this case, uh, what, I, what I need to do, I need to pass this uh, listener configuration and my um, uh, filter configuration here. So um, in this case, in the first time, I, I want to run with... Um, just a listener configuration without anything else. And the uh, second time I'm gonna run this uh, with, um, uh, with filter. So before I start, I need to have very interesting, uh, very interesting thing I wanna also point out. So um, when, you, when, you call, um, when you call caching dot caching provider, it's actually up to um, implementation to provide the actual instance of caching provider. So in Hazelcast, um, we have this um, uh, sort of concept that API between a, a, a sort of server or like a member and API from the client, they actually work with the same, 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 same classes. But in your application, sometimes you don't need to use like dedicated clients. You just want to have your cluster members talk to each other using Jcash. So in this case, we just can uh, we, we can use only um, um, server provider. So for ex for this purpose, in my code, I need to explicitly tell um, what kind of provider I want to use. So in this in this example, probably you will see this kind of line of code. What it says. Okay, so when we start the Hazelcast, Hazelcast needs to provide implementation of caching provider that is um, member, related to member. If I do like this, uh, and like this, or if I do like, like this, it will use um, client uh, provider by default. Uh, so w the, the reason why, why, it, why it works, because in most cases, usually people are uh, comfortable with client cluster or client server um, communication. So in this case, like a client, uh, client caching provider has uh, precedent um, on top of a member provider. So, for, uh, so this is why in my, uh, to run my examples going forward, I need to have um, the cluster running. So in this case, I have one instance of uh, Hazelcast member and uh, when I have my listener, I can do run my listener. Oop. Sorry, where I go? So as you can see, this is output from uh, from the code um, of my listeners. If I run this application uh, with uh, another configuration, so in this case, it's going to be like this. So I want to filter it. So in this case, this is going to be invoked um, on London only. So my, uh, because nothing was created, it was previously uh, available in the cache, only updated uh, caches were, um, uh, were triggered. No, no, no creation, uh, no creation uh, listeners were, were triggered. So let, let me stop it a little quick. And so I will start it from, from fresh. So you will see that created will be actually invoked. So as you can see now, uh, this filter was invoked like successfully and uh, because I just put everything here, um, it was invoked on, on, on London. Any question about this one? Yeah, so right now, yeah. Uh, so it depends on timing. So there is no, huh? Yes, yes. So technically, um, uh, it's not about like who wins. It's, it's all about 
Mm, if you want to have a control over, over this, I, I, I will show you the, 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 the code uh, in a couple of more slides. Um, I will show you wrong way and show you right way. Um, okay, entry, oh, exactly. So I'm going to talk about the entry processor. So uh, this is exactly what, what's happening. So you want to uh, make sure your code uh, will be not affected by some sort of like a side, side, side effects by other people, but you don't want to, but other threads or processes or other clients, but you don't want to introduce explicit locks, for example. So what you can do, you can do get the lock for a particular key, you can write the value and you get unlock. Yeah, but yeah, in this case, it's like very explicit and pessimistic locking. So entry processor allows to do um, atomic modification of, you know, of some logic that you want to uh, implement in your um, in your particular case, and uh, it will guarantee that in given moment in time there would be no side effects. This change that this logic that you put is is going to be um, um, guaranteed at uh, you know modification atomic modification. And actually, it's very nice uh, if we're talking about distributed topology. So it doesn't really matter. Um, you can just um, you know the, the way how how the concurrent map uh, uh, implements this or concurrent hash map implements this. They use uh, the concept of uh, uh, compare and swap. Uh, so you don't you don't need to have like explicit lock on particular value. But um, in a distributed world, like I said, like locks is kind of not not very not very efficient. So entry processor will be actually sent to the data. So when you need to do modification of your data, uh, your entry processor will be executed right next to your data. So this is why it guarantees uh, atomic modification of, of this particular value. And uh, uh, for obvious reasons, it requires serialization if we're talking about distributed world. Because like I said, it's going to be sent over the wire into the uh, member that holds a particular piece of data, obviously. Uh, Tom Cruise. Uh, okay, now entry processor. So um, let's take a look on entry processor first. So, so I want to do each and every time when uh, you know I want to not each and every time I want to do modification of existing um, um, value that's stored in the cache. So I want to just put it into uppercase. So uh, usually what you can do in in uh, in uh, real world uh, or in most cases you already done this sometime in past you can do ca uh, uh, cache dot get uh, key uk you will get some value from from this from this cache after that you need to do uk uh, or you know apply like string to do, dot upper um, what I'm doing here uh, yep to uppercase so I'm doing something here let let's let's do do um thank you to do, 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 do. Nope. Nope. It's uh, it's groovy. <laughs> Anyways, um, so and after that you need to put it, put it back. Like w w after that uh, you do something. And after that uh, you do um, cache. Dot put. Um, uh, UK UK things like that. Oops. Why is this string required? Oh, that, that was interesting. <laughs> For some reason, sometimes IntelliJ idea too smart. Um, so what 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 this code is actually have the problems that you need to retrieve first, do modification, and after that you need to put it back. So it, first of all, it's a it's it's okay if you're doing it with a local cache on the same JVM, but if you're doing distributed cache, 
Um, so in this case, this, this kind of code needs to do round trip. So instead of, instead of uh, doing that, this logic can be um, uh, implemented as an entry processor. Your entries stays on the same place where they are. They store it on the, on the member. And after that, um, we, we just send the piece of computation right next to your data. So if you think about this, um, it maybe doesn't really um, make much sense here in this particular scenario, but if you have like a big chunk of data, you, you need to update multiple fields, and you, you don't want to like bring this, uh, uh, everything on one tiny client, it actually makes a lot of sense uh, if to do um, this kind of distributed uh, computation or processing. So the way how the entry processor works here, um, I instantiate um, entry processor, and after that, cache provides uh, multiple methods that can uh, that allow me um, invoke um, entry processor invoke um, on multiple uh, things. For, for example, uh, we can invoke entry processor on the set of the keys. So instead of doing for each key in my list of keys, cache.get by, by ID, and after that, uh, modify this and put it back. We can say, here you go, this is the set of the keys, and apply this entry processor to the, all these keys. So in this case, uh, in case of distributed uh, computation, this entry processor will be set only in the nodes that will hold some data. Or you can invoke it on particular key in this case. So what I'm doing here, I'm taking the Belgium as a key, and uh, do um, do modification. Yep. So if I will run it, so entry processor was applied, and um, new value for for this guy is get. So as you can see here. Uh, this is like this is very fast happening uh, thing, right? So this is um, something so, something that uh, happens um, um, on the local computer, but it, it can take some time in real life. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the this guy like the the standard uh, the standard um, standard implementation doesn't provide any callbacks or like some asynchronous method. So you need to wait until uh, this method will be executed, basically. Bec this is sort of like a good thing because specification doesn't enforce uh, saying that, okay, this invoke should be always a sync, but why you need to have a sync if you, you know, you can run on the same, same JVM. Um, but in case of distributed, you need to have a sync so you don't need to wait on this line 49 for, you know, all these entries will be pro processed. Um, this kind of things that can be, can be solved and I will talk about this also a little bit later. Um, okay, it's, uh, it's sort of like a persistence. So do we have any questions so far? Yes. You, you started by talking about the comparison between um, the Java collections and this product. Mm -hmm. It's not a product, it's a framework. It's not a framework, it's right. APIs. It's a, it's, a, it's a standard Java APIs. So you, but when I, when I Google your project, your page, you're actually selling an open source pro uh, no, open source is not sold, excuse me. You have the open source um, framework and then you have several layers of service above that, including at the enterprise level, and it appears that that's where you're getting replica, at the end of, somebody, it's either, you, you're, you're a group of open source developers, you're a corporation, because you're selling an enterprise product that has the big kahuna that people would want with enterprise level caching, replication, um, I mean, that's right on the, the page for, uh, Hazelcast.org yeah. Hazel or whatever, whatever the page What's is. What's the question? Uh, the comparison, though, is not, against, is not against the collection classes. The comparison against other open source caching frameworks, such as EHCache, OHCache, JBoss, JBoss caching. And there's a whole lit, I and mean, there's a very large list of open source caching frameworks. I used the EHCache in 2008. Um, OSCache, I'm not sure of the status of it. Where do you differentiate your product and where you, well, you just said it's not a product, it's a bunch of APIs. Where do you differentiate this, whatever you call it, the API? Or so, yeah, well, to, answer your questions, to, to answer your question, to answer your question, 
like I already show this, uh, I'll show this, uh, this example today. There is no proprietary API here, right? You can throw away my product if you don't like it and put hcache, hcache support jcache. Or you can throw you're away... Presenting, you're presenting the APIs of a new JSR, JSR one Yes, one. exactly. Which our, our product is the implementing. Product yeah. So this is the JSR 107. Are you the reference implementation for JSR? No, the reference implementation, by the way, based on hash map. So, <laughs> reference implementation, you can go to GitHub. There is a uh, github.com slash JSR 107 slash RI. There is a reference implementation of, uh, of JCache. So, Hazelcast is not a reference implementation. Uh, how do you differentiate from the Hazelcache? Uh, yeah. Until what time we have our room yeah. here? I can talk about this like hours. Yeah, you, you, you know, we, we can talk about this, uh, you know, let me uh, finish slides and I can explain you how we differentiate from all sorts of products. Okay, I think that I can probably comment real quickly and that is um, having used, you know, Hazelcast in its very early days and, and now today in its very mature days, I can definitely say that one of the huge differentiations about it is the fact that your very first code, before we talk about Jcash and, and, and that API, is the fact that you, you, you talked about Java collections and the Java math, and, and the nice thing about a Hazel, Hazelcast, you can see this on Hazelcast.org, obviously, is you can actually start using it just like you would write Java collections, just by changing your imports yeah. and changing, you look up the map, all your map calls are exactly the same. The difference is that code that used to work in one JVM now works in, in as many JVMs as you can throw money at. Yeah. So. Or you don't need to throw money. You need to throw money for hardware. Yeah. Yeah. You're basically not throwing money for JVM. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is this is why it's talking not about Hazelcast. I'm talking about the the, the standard Java API. Okay. If you if you use JK, uh, Hcache right now, just you know use it with with um, with um, Jcache. And if you use it with Jcache, you will very quickly understand that each cache, it's local cache. And you can, if you need to synchronize multiple caches between different machines, you cannot do it with each cache. In this case, you need to go with commercial uh, Terracotta uh, uh, implementation. Or you can use open source Hazelcast, just throw away each cache uh, using Jcache API, not changing your application code, and you start getting this like distributed collection. We, we're not charging money for this. It's, it's the open source part. It's it's a different thing. It's a different thing. It's a WAN replication. It's a different replication across multiple data centers. It's nothing to do with uh, like cluster cluster synchronization that we have here. I have a I have a couple more slides that explains this. And you know, if you don't like Hazelcast and you're ready to throw a shitload of money, you can bring coherence. Just throw in away Hazelcast. But usually people do opposite. So they throw in away coherence and bring in the Hazelcast. So the whole the point. Um, yes. So I think it's a little bit similar uh, to VCG uh, caching. It's a little bit similar to like logging. You have this SL4J uh, uh, or something? Yeah, SL4J. Yeah, that's only an interface. And behind the thing, you can either use Log4J or you can use Logback. Exactly. So VCG caching is very similar. This is just like a front end, yep. just an interface. You could use a Hazelcast behind the thing or EH cache or whatever. Yeah. It's a similar to everything that you have in, in Java E. If you have a servlet, each and every container has its own implementation of service, but you know that you need to implement uh, Java X servlet. Okay. Exactly. You need to, um, um, if you're using GDBC, for example, um, you throw in just the Oracle driver, and uh, but you're still using the prepare statement and you're using the result set. It's, uh, and uh, you, know, you can use Oracle, you can use uh, the, the, the Postgres. It's all about, you know, Code stays the same, basically. It's all about how the different databases support SQL, but this is not well, not a uh, topic of this same discussion. Interface. It's the API, right. Same interface, different interface. Exactly, yes. Yes. So with uh, databases, you have isolation of the data set. With this caching, um, how, if somebody's making a request and he's trying to retrieve, let's just say, uh, something from the cache, right, the data center key, now when it gets updated, how is the isolation um, taken care of for that? Well, yeah, I just, I just showed one of the uh, entry process, one of the ways how we can do this. Okay. Um, uh, another way, you can use uh, explicit locks 
um, on particular key. I'm not sure. As far as I remember, cache doesn't support locks yet. It doesn't support locks. So in caching, you don't have this. And because caching not supposed to be, uh, you know, provide you uh, isolation, consistency, uh, atomacy, and durability, right? So it's, it's a just a temporal, uh, the, the specification called, um, um, specification called uh, the temporal API for, for Java platform. So it's not meant to be like persistent, right? It's not meant to be, uh, it gives you a certain level of uh, the concurrency guarantees, right? If, you, if you're running this, in this case, like um, if you're running this code, if you do cache.put uh, next, uh, there's a guarantee when you do cache.get by Germany. So in this case, it will return you Berlin. This is guarantee. This is guarantee. Uh, this is guarantee that comes from specification, and actually, this kind of stuff is explained in uh, JCash specification. There is a different levels of um, you know um, consistency guarantees that implementation should uh, comply with, right? So this is why this is like synchronous calls, and uh, in this case, when you do the put, the next call to get for the same key you need to return thing that you just put there, regardless if it's distributed or it's a local. So, question. Yes. If you're doing a cluster, yes. right, and now I was to go to another node and I did uh, um, cache deep in on Germany, right? am I pulling Germany from my node from whatever sync to it or am I pulling it from the node where it was set? It's a good question, put it on the stack, I have a slide for this. Um, do you want to hear about persistence, how it can be done, or I can just jump into the Hazelcast? So next time I need to do just the Hazelcast without like Jcash. So I just want to be, you know, <laughs> polite and talk about like standard things that nothing to do with Hazelcast, but people is eager to learn. How many of you, how many are interested in listening some more about distributed caching versus just Jcash? And how many are interested in Jcash? Why are you guys yeah. here if you're not interested in this one? Okay, so I can return like next February, right? <laughs> before <Yeah>. before <laughs> before the next. Okay. Um, I heard a lot of people beforehand talk about the distributed side. And uh -huh. wanted to see if they needed to front load that versus the JCAS. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll uh, I'll return this, but you know I want to show you something very nice, and I think you people appreciate this. Uh, so how many of you use Spring? How many of you use Spring four? How many of you know that Spring 4 comes with Jcash support as annotations? That's cool, okay. So now you would know why you need Jcash. So in this case, I have a very interesting bin. Very interesting bin. So what it does, you know, it just returns some city. And I have this uh, very nice annotation that also comes from Jcash. So uh, with this annotation, Spring will generate the proxy that will um, persist result of this call inside the cache. So um, there's a bunch of implementation that comes out of the box and the Spring support Jcache um, caching provider as, <coughs> as the cache manager that can uh, um, fulfill this re uh, uh, requirement. So uh, this is uh, my Spring, Spring configuration. So, uh, by the way, if you love Spring and, uh, you know, you want to learn about different aspects of, you know, uh, configuration of Spring, just go to DevNex, it's going to be awesome. Um, so, in this case, I have a bin, the cache manager, and uh, <clears throat> this cache manager is not a uh, Jcache cache manager. It's actually, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Spring lot, this guy from Spring, I guess. Uh, so Spring Framework Cache Manager, you know, first word problem, naming, right? Cache Management, go figure. Okay, so this is, uh, this is bin that Spring will use to, uh, when it generates proxy uh, for this annotated guy. Also, there is another annotation that, uh, that will enables this, uh, enables uh, the, uh, the post processor that will generate this proxy. And this is actually the way how I can, you know, uh, put instance of cache manager. So in this case, um, I, I just use in default what's available on on my uh, on my class path. In in this case, it's Hazelcast. But 
if I need to do something else, I can pro if I have multiple uh, caching providers in my class pass, I can provide uh, something here. Um, by the way, the, the Spring supports um, um, not only jcache, but also hazelcast uh, out of the box to be as a cache manager. So, yes. Um, so where is my Spring cache manager? So what I'm doing here, um, I'm also using client, so I, I don't want to be I uh, don't want to start instance because I want to show you result. So <clears throat> in this case, uh, it's a it's annotation con context. I'm retrieving this uh, bin from annotation context, and uh, first time I'm running, I'm calling this uh, CD from this bin, and I'm collecting some time. It's not benchmark. I just want to collect time, and uh, second time, right? So if I'm gonna run this guy. So you will see it will take very long time. Uh, you know what? Why? I will show you because no one asked me to show the implementation of this bin. But the actual implementation does very nice, th nice thing. It does, you know, remote calls, uh, database, SQL, uh, tons of stuff, MapReduce, and in this line, uh, line number 11. <laughs> and as you can see, first time it took uh, around five seconds, but the second time, it took just a one millisecond to retrieve it from the cache. And as you can see from my, uh, from my uh, the, the control panel, this is my, that was my put over here. First time it was get. So this is, this is your answer why you need to use Jcache. So you can mix and match with different frameworks. Um, Jcache supports inside Java EE using CDI. There is, uh, um, uh, for example, Payara provides the way how you can inject um, that kind of stuff using CDI into your uh, managed bins. Uh, this is annotations, by the way. Okay, now we're talking about missing bits. What's not available and how we can fix this. So first of all, there is no async API. As I already mentioned, that uh, uh, because of the clear consistency guarantees that uh, inside the standard, um, the async API is not implemented because it's going to take another 10 years to implement this. There is no query, so you need to know key when you're retrieving the data. Uh, there is a, you can do this with entry processor, for example, because entry processor returns value. So from the method process of entry processor, you can, you can do some stuff, and after that, you can return some value. Also, you probably can use uh, filters plus uh, listeners, but it's not very reliable. So more or less, you can do it with entry processor. And there is no integration with frameworks like Java EE or servlets, or um, uh, there is no support of Java 8 lambdas. Would be nice if you can, you know, write the entry processor right, like in place, like you do streams and stuff. You asked it. There you go. So actually, this is real Hazelcast cluster, by the way. Um, this is uh, this is cluster that runs inside the uh, Raspberry Pis, and there's a one, two, three, four data centers, and uh, each data center has replication between them. So. And technically, if you just you use the hammer, smash this piece of art, these guys will preserve data. Um, and this is uh, like actually our um, our demo uh, de demo in the Java one. And you can you know if you're passing by our our booth, you can just you know unplug some some clusters like to 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 emulate um, some problems in the network, and uh, you will see that you're not gonna lose this data. Okay, so Hazelcast is in memory data grid. In our opinion, uh, or in our vision, uh, what in memory data grid is that is it three major things. It's in memory, um, it's in memory storage, it's in memory um, uh, computing uh, framework, and it's in memory messaging. So in terms of uh, in memory data store, also known as caching. People saying caching, think about the memory store. Uh, it also applies if you're using uh, hash map as your uh, in memory cache or in memory store. So the Hazelcast, what, what, what it does, it allows you basically, I'm not saying like infinite scale, but you know, it's, it allows you scale up to the limits of your, your budget basically. Um, and uh, 
this kind of thing that is actually effortless. You don't need to configure, you don't need to restart the cluster each and every time you want to change the configuration. You just throw in more machines. Hazelcast will figure out how to find it. Uh, we can use multicast to find a node. We can use TCP. And uh, since uh, the new version of 3.6, we support a bunch of stuff. Like we support cloud discovery using Amazon API. We support uh, Kubernetes. We support um, uh, Zookeeper. We don't need this. <laughs> but you can do this. Uh, in Zookeeper, uh, it's just another storage where you store some, some of the key value things. Hazelcast doesn't require this, but if you need to have Zookeeper, you can use Zookeeper. We have this discovery API that can be you know, integrated with any system pretty much. So the, w the way how it works, you know, when, the m when the member will start, it will just query some, some storage. Uh, in your case, it might be Zookeeper um, or a multicast or TCP or whatever. And after that, it's fine. Okay, there is a bunch of people. I can join them, and uh, I will uh, good to go. And uh, in this case, it also behave as uh, um, how it's called unified access layer for your application. So you don't your application may not worry about your business logic. May not worry about how this data actually retrieved by plugging. You didn't, didn't want to listen about persistent, but <laughs> it was a very important part. <laughs> So this is how, how uh, I, I will post slides anyways, and the code already on GitHub. Um, uh, if something in 2015, something not in GitHub, it's not gonna happen. Uh, it didn't happen. So in this case, uh, Hazelcast in this particular picture behaves as the uh, unified layer for accessing data for multiple uh, heterogeneous sources. Um, in terms of uh, messaging, uh, you already know JMS. Who knows JMS? JMS is just API, and that's very difficult. How many of you knows about blocking queue? Blocking queue? Blocking queue? Anyone else? It's easy, right? You can do blocking queue dot offer, and you can do blocking queue dot dot uh, uh, dot pull, or you can do um, because it's the it's also it's also you can access it as as as, as a list as well, and it's easy. And uh, what we did, we give you same API that you do with blocking queue and bring it to the distributed, uh, distributed system. So you actually have a cluster that supports your queue. Uh, and if one node goes down, uh, there's always another node that will pick up and continue service. Also, we support topic and we support um, ring buffer. How many of you know this ring buffer? Ring buffer is awesome thing. If you don't know ring buffer, uh, this is like a first uh, task for, for homework. You, you, uh, you spend your weekend learning about ring buffer and uh, LMAX and disruptor. That's very cool, uh, very cool thing that's like, it's a really mind opener because it allows you to start thinking about uh, uh, communication between the processes and communication between uh, different components in log free way. And we support a distributed ring buffer. It's nothing to do with Disruptor or LMAX. Uh, we have our own implementation, and it's distributed. Um, and also, uh, we have a distributed uh, computation engine. Some pieces of distributed computation, you already saw this, because entry processor, basically, this is a piece of computation that was sent over the wire next to, the, to, to be executed next to your data. And once the data is loaded, as you, can, uh, as you saw from the first example, um, it would be wasteful to, to bring this data back and forth, right? So to bring it to the client, or we have a like, very tiny client here, and we can bring like terabytes of data, and this would just destroy it. So in this case, client can initiate uh, the call for, for logic, and this logic will be executed right next to your data. <clears throat> So this is like a purpose of this framework. And uh, as was already said here, that Hazelcast, you already know Hazelcast, because we not inventing uh, some very sophisticated APIs. If you know how the collection works, you can use Hazelcast, because there is a maps list sets. If you know how the executor service works, if you know how to do like submit or you do execute, you know how the Hazelcast uh, uh, distributed computation works because we follow the same patterns. We, we're actually extending executor service and putting some additional methods for more granular um, calculation so you can, uh, you can execute on one node or only on the node that holds particular key, only nodes that hold set of the keys or other sorts of um, uh, rules. 
Uh, scale out computing, bring more machines, not, uh, not grow in beef of one big machine, so it's not Oracle exit data. Uh, resilience, it's built in. So if the node goes down, we know how to recover data from the backups that spread across the cluster, across multiple other nodes. A programming model, as already said here, it's very easy. Um, you already know this. It's just a couple new things that you need to learn in terms of how to write XML <laughs> to make this thing work. You also know this, Spring, thanks to Spring and uh, Java E. Uh, and uh, because we're, we're not touching the disk, everything is happening in memory. So this is why we have very fast performance. So let's talk about uh, particular caching cases that we have in Hazelcast. We already touched about the uh, Jcache here. Jcache, why I said Jcache. Um, Jcache, we support Jcache. We support uh, caching with Spring, including Jcache, including Spring um, uh, Cache Manager that uh, we provide. Also, we support off-heap storage. And this kind of part, we're asking money for, for this kind of part. But not many people actually uh, uh, interested in having it off-heap. They can just run everything on, uh, on heap and they can be happy ever after. Um, we also have Jcache extensions. So remember when I showed you some of the APIs, uh, Jcache APIs, like, uh, uh, they, they're all synchronous. So we actually implemented all APIs that are available as synchronous form. We implemented them in asynchronous form. Also, we have um, extension that allows you to uh, define your custom expired policy. Uh, we didn't talk about this much, but uh, you can find this uh, in, my, in my code after. Um, this is kind of um, configuration that comes from the Hazelcast. The things that you can do programmatically also support it, but sometimes you don't want to do this. Uh, you can have like very nice XML file. Here's your, um, this is how you define listeners. Instead of creating configuration programmatically, you can define it inside this uh, Hazelcast um, XML file. Um, you can provide the um, um, reader, uh, that will read from database and loader, oh, sorry, writer that writes for database and loader that loads from database, also here. Uh, from perspective, how to use it? Again, not we, we didn't invent this. This is a standard that gives us this. So the part of the standard cache, there's a method called unwrap. So they actually, the creators of the, uh, of the specification, they put this sort of, uh, the way how the implementers, uh, how to developers can get access to underlying implementation of the cache. So in this case, when you run the unwrap in, in, in case of Hazelcast, other, uh, other uh, implementers, they, they provide their own um, uh, version of their own implementation. And from the iCache perspective, this is already Hazelcast, uh, Hazelcast data structure that can be used, for example, in um, asynchronous way. So when you do um, uh, when you do get and put async, so next code, the next line of code will be executed immediately, and only after things will happen, you know, f f you know, uh, the entry will be written into the cache, we'll get the response back, and uh, this is uh, uh, we, for for those of you. How many of you know about completable future, by the way? C completable future, nice thing. The second thing that you're going to learn on this weekend, like first thing was LMAX disruptor and uh, ring buffer, and the second thing is completable future. If you're using Java 8 and not using completable future, you're wasting your time. Start using it. It's a very nice thing. Um, uh, we have this completable future thing for Java 6 and 7, because Hazelcast support Java 6, 7, and 8. So we need to implement our own implementation for this. But essentially, idea of uh, uh, Java completable future is similar. It's just, you know, you assign some listener that uh, gonna be invoked after um, this thing would be executed. So you don't need to do future.get to block this call to wait until result will arrive. So in this case, your result will, will, be, will be here. Data distribution. So, two typical data distribution patterns. Who can spot at least one? 
replication, sharding. Replication, sharding. So replication. So when we have a replication, we just literally copy same piece of data on this on another member. So and uh, this approach doesn't scale for, for obvious reasons, right? So you cannot um, you cannot grow uh, you can grow like size of your uh, the memory that you can use is will be limited by size of your smallest member that you can put inside the cluster. With partitioning or sharding, they're actually following different approach. You have, um, you slicing your data and distribute this data by chunks on different members or different nodes. And uh, with Hazelcast, we basically follow the partitioning pattern because we want to have scalability. So here's an example. So by default, uh, we have in Hazelcast, we have a 271 partition. Uh, think about partition as, as the as a unit of data migration or of a unit of data distribution, right? So um, when you do map.put or cache.put, what we do, we take your key, we serialize this key, we make them uh, as a stream of byte, and after that we, um, we apply a consistent hashing algorithm for, for this key to get um, certain, uh, a certain number, that after gonna be mod by the number of partitions, 271. And in this case, we will get partition ID where we're gonna store this value. Once again, map or oh, cache dot put, we take the key, we calculate partition ID, for example, partition number three, and we serialize and put value inside here. Make sense? So um, you can ask, okay, Victor, uh, so what about the backups? So nothing about backups. You have one node, everything in memory, node dies, nothing's gonna happen. However, if you have more than one node, we can talk about uh, backups and um, we can talk about data safety now. So uh, the, the, the thing that was known here as the partitions now have two flavors. First partition, it's, it's called primary partition. So the partition that actually will be used to write your data. And there is backup partitions that will sort of mirror uh, other uh, partitions. So for example, we have node one, and we, uh, we, we're storing uh, our data in partition number two. So in this case, synchronously or asynchronously, backup will be created for um, partition number two in different member. Why well, I'm saying that synchronously or asynchronously, it's a matter of configuration. Um, because in Hazelcast, particularly, we can have synchronous backups. So the synchronous backup will be created during the same call when you do map dot or map dot put or cache dot put. So until the entry will be written on particular partition and backup will be written on the different partition, this method will not gonna return result. However, if you have a synchronous backup, you can do map dot put and after that, um, uh, the, you can continue your, you know, doing your stuff in your code, but uh, Hazelcast will take care of asynchronously uh, send uh, backup to another node. Yes, please. Uh, so, how well does this scale? Is it pretty linear? I love this question. I always ask this question. It's uh, uh, no offense. It's just a really, it's awesome question to ask to any, any sorry. Any question? How, does it scale? It's 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 it's, it's not a joke. Um, yes, it scales pretty linearly, but you need to know a couple things about this. So first of all, which uh, you need to keep, um, I would say, in 80% of cases that I see or in the clients and users and stuff, it scales pretty well, almost linearly. However, so what we're saying that. To have very nice, uh, uh, how, how can I say? Um, to have very nice uh, benefits from speed and safety, we need to keep the partition size around maybe 100 megabytes. So because partition is a unit of migration and this kind of stuff needs to migrate or you know, in case of failure, this guy needs to be moved over the network really fast. 
um, we're saying that, okay, it's around 100, uh, uh, it's around 100 uh, megabytes. So if you do like calculations, you'll get 271 times 100, that's roughly around uh, 27 gigabytes-ish, or maybe less, right? So in this case, if you're not going beyond this size, you, you're good. Like, if you have like 10 gigabytes, you're good. You don't need to worry about configuring anything. Will work, work fine. Another thing needs, you need to think about is about this number. So this number is actually, you know, if, it, if we're scaling this, we're actually dividing this partition equally across multiple, um, multiple members. So if your cluster goes beyond, I don't want to say like 271 members, right? But um, in realistically, we also recommend that each and every node should hold at least seven to 10 partitions max. If you hover less, so in this case you might have, um, some of the node might be more saturated with data, some of the node might be less saturated with data. So that's why we're saying uh, there's another number. It's uh, 5,000, oh sorry, 1,503. It's another default that we can recommend for some users. But like I said, if you have roughly 20 nodes, or you have roughly uh, 25 gigabytes of data, you don't need to worry about um, configuring or, you know, partition number you can change its configuration wise. It's not, not, not internal, it's not hard coded, nothing. Um, and I don't know your network. It's everything also depends on network. If your network allows, you know, to, to stream more than 100, 100 of uh, megabytes of data, it's, it's just empirical. Like, this is what I saw in real life. Yeah. Okay, so four years ago I talked with your team on Adelos, and I remember that the biggest problem we had in that point of time was a situation when one of the nodes get out of sync, you know, and then and you need to return to sync. So can you improve that? I know that that was the biggest one. Too. It's version two-ish something, right? Uh, in version three, a bunch of logic was rewritten, and Right now, it's a 3.6. Um, it's much, much better in terms of like, synchronization and how it's like consistency. Uh, give it a try and see if your use case still, uh, you know, there's some problems with this. Just let us know, like write a GitHub issue and, or, you know, Stack Overflow, send me email. I, I have on Twitter, just, you know, find me there. Uh, yep. Not your no, 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 it's fine. Uh, so I'm curious about, um, I don't know if you're going to show the configurations for, uh, for caches. So, in this one, can you set up the max values? Can you set up the eviction policies and different eviction strategies? <clears throat> so, for for caches, you can. For inside the cache, you can set ma max entries, and for maps, you also can. Uh, there is eviction policy that say like per um, uh, per member, how many entries particular member can hold, or how many members particular partition can hold per member. You can also have this you know, control, like how many entries this particular small guy will hold. So you, you, you have it. I'm asking about eviction strategies, so. Um, yes, I understand. Are you like talking about like eviction policies? Like, yes, yes. Um, like age or yeah. things like that? What are, do you have it's policies it's like that? <laughs> yes, like, yes. So you can, you can set the policy which is look at the kin uh, no. no. Okay. We're working on something called uh, the custom policy, so you potentially can implement this. Um, but we, we don't have it by default. Uh, w w so I can say like a hit ratio, I can say like maybe least recently used or least frequently used. This kind of stuff we have out of the box. However, um, the custom, custom not yet, it's, it's not there. We, uh, we work and it would be available on 3.7. Yes. Um, is the management of this um, partition, is, is this done in, um, using open source techniques, or is there, are there a lot of proprietary tools here for, for managing this? Like I mentioned Zookeeper earlier, um, I might, I mean, it may not be apples to oranges, but there's tools such as Nimbus. Where does this fit, does this play well with the whole ecosystem that's growing up around a lot of these tools? It doesn't. No, <laughs> it, it has. That was my suspicion. No, it's not, it's actually a good thing, because we have open source thing about behind this, so this is our stuff, we're not depending on any open source stuff. This is out, uh, it, this, is, uh, this is implemented by us, it's available as a part of the open source, you can take a look in the code. The cluster manager is part of 
the, this kind of stuff of management of partitions, yes. That's, that's everything, like the, this core, it's, it's all open source. Yes? It's free, it's fast, and it's reliable. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy to use, like with the jar and that. Really I didn't say that. We use it as our underlying investment technology in Google Cloud, but it's not free to use, so it's free to use for some people. Um, the, um, the, the, uh, if, if you have you use, how many of you use uh, Vertex? Vertex. That's cool. <laughs> the Vertex, uh, this is actually a very cool framework that allows you to, um, uh, to write your server-side like, application on any language of that available in JVM, and you can mix and match. You can write a piece of your, uh, of your application on Java, piece, a piece of like, some module on the Scala, and uh, the thing is that um, the Vertex relies on the Hazelcast 4HA, so if your member runs your Scala code goes down, um, this code will be seamlessly migrated to another node, and they use Hazelcast to, to do that kind of thing. It's a little bit of heap. Um, I, I, um, I, I wanna talk about just a little quick. So sometimes some people, they uh, say, okay, so I have a big machine. I don't really care about, the, uh, about having this stuff. Right about uh, about the uh, multiple machines. Just want to put in one terabyte machine everything. So this is you can start many JVMs there. This is a plus. Um, you can uh, you will lose a lot of memory for because we don't have unfortunately right now multi-tenant JVMs that allows us to you know have some shared pieces um, like except the IBM they have it um, um, allow to share some pieces of the of the code. Um, and just use efficiently more data. And uh, what, what we actually did, we implemented this uh, high density memory that allows using same API, just a switch of configuration. Inside the configuration, you just say the native, and in this case, you get the off heap memory. So we can allocate for JVM that holds, for example, two megabytes of heap, or two gigabytes of heap. Uh, we can allocate up to um, recent, what we did for Java one, we have a cluster with eight members. Each member has half a terabyte of RAM, and um, uh, we run this eight members e with four gigabytes of heap, um, and we hold around three and a half terabytes of data um, on, on this one. So we, we did this. So year before, we did the cluster with uh, tiny machines with Raspberry Pis. We showed this, it works. And uh, this year, we did, um, with big machines, so and actually, this is not that. Uh, that's not that. Not, uh, for example, Amazon uh, recently released X1 machines that you can have uh, half a terabyte of RAM on your cloud. So actually, it's pretty cool. Um, I'll skip that. Obviously, less garbage collection pauses because your data is stored outside of the heap. It's not the subject of garbage collection, and. Um, Minor pauses happens, but they not will affect um, actual storage. Take the picture of this. <laughs> <laughs> this is slides. This is code. Um, it's, um, uh, you can find me on the GitHub and ask some question. The Twitter, my Twitter is the same as my GitHub handle. Um, thank you for your time. I hope uh, it helped to, to, to understand some of the concepts. And uh, I hope to see some of you at the Dev Nexus next year. And we have some announcement from our sponsor. Yeah. Okay. So I have the raffle. Um, so the first two prizes are Starbucks gift cards. Um, so number thirteen. Do you want to? Do you want to random? And then also um, number forty-two. Did you guys call 40? No, yeah. Sorry, And then for um, the, there's a, a single connector um, drive backup, um, what do you call the thing? Battery, auxiliary battery. Um, that the single one goes to. Number 31.
one. Okay, and the dual one, the big um, mini one, goes to number 45. Number 45? 45. 45? 45? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty bad when you, you can tell I shot for things I wanted. <laughs> Just hoping nobody would show up. Okay. Um, and number seven. The seven, the next one, <coughs> five number seven goes oh, to. I'm sorry, to number thirty-three. <laughs> <laughs> number thirty-three. It's not. It's not. It's not done yet, right? So I will take some questions right now, and I have a bunch of T-shirts there. If the question would be good, you'll get your T-shirt already. I have a point of question from you today. <laughs> What's your size, sir? What's your size? T-shirt size? Large. Do you have large? Yes. And we have a winner here. Uh, I'll take uh, more questions. So, time to question. We have some some time, right? Like, ten minutes. Uh, which one? Oh, there was plenty of questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will. I will. Yes. Answer is easy. So, so first of all, memcached um, doesn't have uh, distributed nature. So it's just uh, one process that have uh, unlimited resources that you can write into this memcached. So if you want to start the clusters of this memcached, like I said, you can do replication. Easy, right? You can do replication or you can do manual sharding, but in this case your driver needs to support this. Uh, if you're using um, like spider memcache, um, spider, what's the, what's there's like two, two different or three different drivers that are available. Um, in terms of storage, with memcache, you have like, a, um, you need to think about how you're gonna namespace your data. So you need to think about how you will create the key and how you're gonna store it because there's no namespace, there's no separate buckets inside the memcache. In Hazelcast, you can have multiple data structure for a particular use case, you, like, like you have a tables in database, for example, and you need to worry about thinking, okay, so I need to come up with some very sophisticated key, and I need to make sure that this doesn't exist in cache. Another thing that uh, memcache, Redis, or other solution, they don't have ability to do run computation on top of your data. So they only allows you to do storage. You store data there, you need to pull data back to do some computation or any other engine. So you cannot send an uh, entry processor to do atomic modification of this data. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, uh, friendship with Java and uh, Java developers, um, you need to manually do serialization of, of object or just need to rely on Java serialization. So you can say, okay, so you do, do it serializable, but serializable is not the best thing that we have in Java, right? So it, it, it's not super fast. It's not, um, gives better size. So this is why um, we provide three, our own implementation. We support serializable, externalizable, and we support any available framework that you can plug with Hazelcast. You can pull, plug cryo, uh, protocol buffers, thrift, whatever you want. It can be, uh, huh? Gentleman in hat. Did you get a shirt? Okay. <laughs> Actually, um, um, to nail this question down, Hazelcast has memcache interface. So you can start with your legacy application connecting with the memcache client to the Hazelcast. And, you know, yeah, just live with this ever after. Yes. Would you mind to please compare Hazelcast with Couchbase? Well, we have. I wrote the article on our website about uh, the comparison with Couchbase. Same, you know, same, uh, same basic thing. The Couchbase is the databases. They have persistency. We don't have. We we're out of. We we in memory. So this is why, you know, we can actually work on top of the Couchbase easy. Um, you know, Java. Uh, they have Java driver. Uh, you can plug it uh, to the map and you know do the write through um, that through Hazelcast into Couchbase. So instead of like building uh, the, the, the cluster of Couchbase, you can put the Hazelcast cluster on top and just work with, you know, some piece of your application can write to Couchbase, some piece of your application can write to Mongo. 
I also wrote the Mongo blog. Do you find that to be often a configuration that people use? Well, um, some of the things that's available uh, in us, for example, if they do computation, they need to bring the data from, from, from database. And in this case, it's regardless if you're using Hazelcast or you're using Coherence or if you're using any other products, right? You need to bring somehow data to do computation because they don't provide uh, sort of like computations. There, there is some, for example, in Redis, they have a Lua to writing stored procedures. But you cannot consider as, you know, as real um, the computation, the framework on top of data. Yes, you have a, a Redis data or like, yeah, I don't remember if they, because they just, just released some, some new version, maybe they introduced some of the nice features in terms of computation, but it's just a, like a database. They, they also have a SQL-like language. So in terms of Hazelcast, I talk about Jcache, and Jcache doesn't have any query concept. In Hazelcast maps, that in other structure that uh, built on top Java map, uh, we have a pretty good API that allows you to write queries. So instead of like uh, searching by key, you can write, okay, give me all entries where first name uh, Victor and last name Gamov. And after that, it will execute um, this predicate API on top of map. We support indexes as well. So the, the, this data that's stored inside the Hazel case can be indexed and this query will be work faster. Yes. yes. How, well, how well have you integrated to the Spark ecosystem? S it's a spoiler alert. <laughs> it, we're gonna announce it really, really soon. Uh, the uh, good news for Hazelcast, bad news for Spark. We did we did a lot of uh, internal testing, and uh, we we faster in stuff that they do. We just took their benchmark for like uh, word counts, and we we just you know no, run no, our no, stuff. No, Why? <laughs> Why? Why to play nice with them? <laughs> we have a lot of customers that use it in. Conjunction with Hazelcast, but um, so we, we basically have performance has it been enough for them with some of their real time analytics on streaming data, especially if they're trying to like, um, you know, manage like a big, you know, set of generators or wind farms or something, and they want to do some things off the data quickly without having to move the data. Um, so for those particular use cases, we will have an alternative for them. Um, but we can still work with Spark. Yeah, we actually working on some prototypes of RDD for Spark, basically. So this is the way how we can integrate with them. So just provide storage. Um, did I say we have MapReduce in Hazelcast? I didn't. So we have MapReduce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what you mentioned? Yeah. yeah. I'm curious. You talked about the traditional Linux, or you have maybe uh, reverse Linuxes for a text search? Uh, we don't have full, full text search. Uh, you can have um, you can have ordered indexes, so but it's not like full full text search. We we not 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 that current roadmap. Maybe we, we right now um, that's so we're wrapping up the release. Our release will will will, will three six will gonna be available for GA at the end of year. And starting from 3.6, we're going to work on improvements in terms of um, querying. We're going to introduce a whole new concept of how our queries handled. And uh, potentially, maybe there would be room for full text search as well. So we, we're, not, uh, we're not integrating with, for example, InfiniSpan integrates with Lucene uh, because uh, it's a Red Hat and Lucene also sponsored by Red Hat. So they need to, uh, they have a J groups for, for cluster discovery. They integrate a bunch of frameworks. And they also running on top of his uh, Hibernate search. So we wouldn't have this integration, uh, but uh, you know, n no one actually ask, you know, yeah, no one, for, from our clients. So this is the way how it works. You know, our clients, community people, uh, they can, you know, request some of the features you know, and uh, you know, talking to us, talking to me, talking to Lean, right? And uh, we're working with our product team to see. We just finished this planning for 3.7, so <laughs> like all features are booked. Um, uh, so this is why I'm saying, like, we, what's gonna be in near releases? 
but what's gonna not gonna be in the new releases. So full text search is not at our radar, at least for three months when we uh, wrap up another release. Yep. This is another technical question. So is your business model for Hazelcast kind of like similar to like GitHub? You have a community edition and then you have an enterprise edition in 60 days? Well, so we, we're a commercial open source company. So we're a commercial open source company. We have open source product that's available for everyone. We have like a, a contributors from, from external. However, we have a certain set of plugins that is closed source, is not available to anyone in terms of like uh, for free. So we, we, we actually take in the money. So yes, we have this uh, uh, model where we can, you know, ask money for some advanced stuff. For example, you have multiple data centers and you care about um, uh, data, uh, how it's called? Uh, no, 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 it's, an, it's um, just give me a second. Uh, disaster recovery yeah. and you have multiple data centers or you have a multiple uh, uh, users that distributed across multiple <laughs> regions uh, like you have a London users you have a, a New York users and you have a, a, a San Francisco users and uh, they have each and every user group deployed with their own version of your application so how to consolidate this data so this is why we have uh, the, the enterprise vendor application that allows to cluster connect in active active mode so this data can be um, interchanged between clusters. But this is a kind of example of what you do. <clears throat> Another thing that we have coming to 36 is uh, hot restart. So what it does, like I said, we in memory. However, sometimes like when people is having like a terabytes of uh, data in memory, they want to have ability in case of failure or in case of they need to restart cluster for maintenance, they want to dump this data into the, um, into the disk and to restore it quickly. So this is another feature that's going to be um, enterprise based, basically hot restart that allows like a very fast cache uh, restart from, from, from disk, this kind of stuff. So if you reboot, you have to warm up cache before right. you Yes. So you don't have to have a whole lot of more back end load while the cache yes. is in. Yeah. It's particularly useful, like if you have a terabyte or two of or four of data and RAM. I mean, it could take and take several hours to do it the old way. So you could have warmed up and get about. Or if it's like a result of calculation, you need to like spend some time to to recalculate this data once again. Yeah, and you're putting a lot of pressure on the back end right. to do that calculation while the cache is warm. Right. Yep. Yes. So JCAC looks like a looks like a very useful tool. What I'm wondering is. People are going to start using a lot. Are there are there anti patterns? Are there times it looks like it'd be a good idea, but it really isn't a good idea to use JCash for something? Okay, awesome question. So sometimes, so the thing is that, like I already mentioned today, um, having uh, JCash that doesn't care about your topology or doesn't care about the way how the data is stored, um, it makes it um, a little bit. You need to understand like what kind of implementation you're running. For example. Uh, if you're doing jcache via some local, uh, some local cache, each cache, so when you do size of the cache, it's local operation, and it will just return you like the cached result with size of the cache. However, if you're running distributed version of the jcache and you try to get the size, so in this case, the call would be executed to all members. They need to collect their data need to send their data, and after that it needs to be combined on the result. So in this case, it's sort of um, curse and blessing, right? You don't need to, you know this API, but when you start using this API, and uh, you can, you can, if you didn't think about this before, and you're thinking, oh, that size, it should be not super expensive operation. However, in distributed world, it will be expensive. Another, um, another example of uh, that kind of approach is serialization. In, in, in Java, we have pretty slow serialization, and if you're running distributed world, you also you can say, oh, Victor, I just tried the Hazelcast with, uh, with test, and you know, it's super slow. Why? Because I'm trying to put object that has hash map in, inside, a list uh, inside something like that. And uh, it takes a lot of payload, and Java serialization would be not super efficient here. Or you can say, okay, Victor, I have a situation where 
um, I need to do queries, but again, my, my object is super big. So in this case, you need to use serialization that support partial deserialization. We have this. <laughs> so the, basically, it works as the same as, uh, as uh, from, from API perspective, you can do it like a JSON. You can do get property and uh, provide a name. In this case, we know how to find this name inside this binary payload. It just retrieve this piece of, uh, or test this piece of data instead of deserializing the whole blown object. So it's multiple things uh, in terms of, you know, what to do, what not to do. Um, well, I already said uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, it's, it's good for framework developers because they also work in against API, but it's very difficult for, uh, you know, the framework has like us, like support everything. For example, I talk about the size, but there's no size. There's no size method in cache. So when I do here, I'll show you. Um, where's my test? Yeah. So if I do um, cache size, there's no method size. The standard doesn't have method size because it's not supposed to be storage according to the specification. It's supposed to be, um, it's supposed to be like a temporal something, temporal medium. So in this case, what you need to do, you need to do cache.unwrap. Oops. And you do i i cache. So in this case, this guy. Oops. Uh, where is it? Done. Size. <laughs> yeah. So this is why, like, uh, I think the lots of nice stuff will come in Jcache 2.0. I hope it's not gonna take another 10 years uh, because they're already working on, on, on the, some of the things, for example, integration into JE world. How would it be nice to have ability to uh, cache result of some servlet, for example, just put a notation ca like cache result and, uh, and on top of your servlet um, and you know, call of do get or do post will be, will be cached. It's actually a very, very, very nice thing. Say it again? Uh, not necessarily. Yeah, it looks like I'm almost done with three minutes more than, uh, than I'm supposed to. Thank you for your time. Um, yeah. uh,